Welcome back into our class BI 100, the gospel according to Matthew. Now this is this is the second half of part, of part four that we're looking at, and it's really crucial that you go back to the first half, the last segment that we did, in order to understand how we're going to proceed forward in this particular segment. And we're looking at Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, where the Word of God says, The record of the genealogy, the record of the geneal genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. This is where we still are at the right at the very beginning in verse 1 of Matthew chapter 1. It is absolutely crucial that our people understand the background to how we get to Matthew chapter 1 verses 1 through 17. And this is where we left off and once again let me repeat. You need to go back to our previous teaching. Uh, you have to look at the previous uh, teaching video as well as the notes in order to glean exactly where we're going from this point forward. That is crucial. Now time is precious so we're not going to go over it all over again. But I do want to draw your attention to where we left off in our last session. And that is this, that the Jews had misinterpreted God's word by saying that the eternal kingdom promised to David was the Jewish nation and the Jewish nation only. That's how they had interpreted. You have to remember, by the time that we get to, to the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament, by the time we get to the time of the prophet of Isaiah, which is approximately somewhere between seven and 800 years before Jesus Christ walks on earth. Right? Judaism as a religion was already a corrupt religion. It was already at the, at the highest levels of being an apostate religion. It had really turned everything around upside down and began and, and had already misinterpreted many of the prophecies that the previous descendants of Judaism had correct. That's crucial to understanding why we get to Matthew chapter 1 verse 1 as to the importance of indicating that the record of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah the son of Abraham and the son of David is so crucial for us to understand. Do not discard the genealogy simply because you just read it and you don't understand the background to it. So, and as I just mentioned, the Jews have misinterpreted God's word by saying that the eternal kingdom that was promised to David was the Jewish nation and the Jewish nation only. They at that time period, expected that Israel to be established as the earthly nation forever, as an earthly nation forever, and all the other nations to be subservient to Israel. But again, God's promise was not that was not that narrow, nor was it that it nor was it that prejudiced either. The Bible says there is not and never has been any respect of persons with God. This is where we left off in, in our last session, and I want to and I want you to understand. We said, and, and, and we went through that in detail. I'm not going to go through it again, other than the fact to tell you that the Scripture tells us very, very clearly, okay, that God does not deal with His people with partiality whatsoever. And you remember we we looked at we looked at Deuteronomy chapter ten verse seventeen. We looked at Second Chronicles chapter nine verse seven. We looked at Job chapter thirty four verse nineteen. We looked at Acts chapter ten verse thirty four. We looked at uh, Romans chapter two verse eleven. We looked at um, Galatians chapter two verse six. We looked at Ephesians chapter six verse nine. We looked at um, Colossians chapter three verse twenty five. We looked at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17, and that was really, really crucial to what we were talking about. Now, God did say that Christ was to come from the Davidic line. Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, was to come from the Davidic line. That's why Matthew chapter 1, verse 1 tells us that this is the record of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of Abraham and the son of David. Okay? So God did say that. Okay, but he also said that he was going to establish an eternal nation, an eternal nation. It was not just going to only be Israel. It's an eternal nation made up of people from everywhere who will love God supremely. This is where I want to draw your attention to in the book of Romans, chapter 2, verse 28 and 29. So let's revisit that scripture and maintain as our foundational text, Matthew, chapter 1, verse 1. 
In Romans chapter 2, verse 28, 29, it says, For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. So you are not a Jew just because ethnically speaking, okay, you're born in the Jewish lineage, okay? And you look like a Jew, you dress like a Jew, you talk like a Jew, you eat like a Jew, you practice religion like a Jew. No, no, no. That, that's what he's saying right here. But then he clarifies it in verse 29. He says, but he is a Jew. That's you and I. He says, who is, who is one inwardly and circumcision is that which is of the heart. It's not of the flesh. Our hearts have been circumcised, okay, spiritually speaking, by the spirit, not by the letter. And his praise is not from men, but from God. By misinterpreting God's promises, the Jews failed. They failed in what? They failed to be missionaries to the world that God had chosen them to be. This is the exact same problem that we face in the church today. In that we're very comfortable sitting on the pews, sitting on the seats, okay? We're clapping our hands, we jump up and down, we sing and dance for two, three hours in the church service. The preacher comes and he preaches maybe a 15, 20 minutes. Everybody's falling asleep, but they had a good time dancing and singing. And they just and they just carry on and carry on. But they're not engaged as missionaries and as evangelists in their communities. That's what that's why Israel came short of the glory of God because they failed to do that and we're doing the same thing again. We are repeating that same failure. They became, Israel, earthly bound. They became earthly bound and materialistic minded. Isn't that what's happening with the churches today? Isn't that where the majority of our people are today? Am I lying? Am I misrepresenting the truth? Isn't it true? Is it not true? That that's exactly what's happened to our churches. Our people are earthly bound, materialistically minded. They twisted the idea of the promised Messiah, speaking about the Jews. They twisted the idea of the, of the promise of the Messiah to fit their own little schemes, their own way of thinking. They conceived of him as one who was to establish an earthly kingdom for the Jewish nation only. And that's what a lot of that's how a lot of Christian churches operate today. Now, what, you, what we need to grasp and understand that they failed. They failed, and I cannot find another word. Now, if you find another word, just text me, let me know, okay? But they failed to see that God was speaking. Israel failed to see that God was speaking. Just like today, we failed to see that God is speaking. That God was speaking of what? He was speaking of an eternal kingdom, an eternal kingdom of righteousness. That's what he was speaking about. They failed to see that God was speaking of a kingdom that is of another dimension. Completely different entirely. The dimension of the spiritual, in other words. They failed that God was speaking of a new heaven and a new earth that would be give that would give each person an eternal life beyond just one earthly generation. That's what they had failed to do. And this is why that genealogy is so crucial. Three, number three, God had no choice. God had no choice but to make a third move. Okay? He made a third move. This he did by sending his own son into the world through the Jewish nation. God sent him so that the world through him might be saved. Now, let me draw your attention and hold your place in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. And now go to John chapter 3, 16, which is one of the most abused verses in the entire Bible. But look at it in its proper context. John chapter 3, verse 16, 17, 18, and 19. Look at this with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Now, this is exactly okay what Matthew chapter 1 verse 1 is talking to us about. That this is the record of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of Abraham, the son of David. That this is the impetus, this is the reason, this is the motive why we get to John 3.16. And remember, the Bible is not formatted for us in a chronological order. It's broken down to us by subjects. 
And now, in verse 17 says, For God did not send the world, did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Why? Because that was his original intention. That's what the whole call of the nation of Israel, it was to evangelize their known world, to bring the pagan world into the light of who God the Father is. Verse 18, he who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Verse 19, this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and the men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. However, we shouldn't be surprised. We, I mean, we shouldn't be surprised that man rejected God's son and crucified him. You know, it's really easy for us as Gentiles to be extremely arrogant and judgmental. Why did why did the Jews reject Jesus? I don't know. For the same reason that the Gentiles reject Jesus today. I mean, let's not get so highty and mighty and just look down our long noses and condemn the Jews. Where do we get, where, where, where do we come up with that idea when we do the exact same thing that we condemn them for? This act, the killing of God, the killing of God's son was the final blow. When man slew the only son of God, the whole world was involved. Both Jew and Gentile were represented symbolically in the Jewish religionists and the Roman authorities. They both actually did the plotting. They both actually did the uh, sentencing. They both actually did the execution. If the world was to ever be saved, it was now perfectly clear that God had to make every move himself. You know, when I, when I was a young boy and I was being raised in the church, mm -hmm, being raised in the Roman Catholic Church, and I remember this, and I remember this teaching as a child that we were told that the Jews killed Jesus. And since we weren't Jews, well, we don't have anything, we don't have anything to worry about, right? But you forget that it was the Roman Empire, Gentiles, that's what we are, represented us, and the Jewish uh, uh, religious religionists, right, together combined, if you read the Gospels very carefully, especially the book of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you can see this very, very clearly, okay? It's impossible not to see it. They both were involved equally in the judgment of Jesus Christ, in the sentencing of Jesus Christ, and in the killing of Jesus Christ. This, now, now God has to make his move. He, this he did once and for all. In his eternal purpose, the plan for man's salvation, God took the sins of all the men and laid them upon his son, Jesus, while he was being slain upon the cross. He allowed his son to bear the sins of the world. Let me show you. Open your Bibles to the book of Peter. 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. Notice the language in this verse. And it says, he says, And he himself bore our sins, he himself, Jesus, parentheses, bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might not die to so that we might die to sin and to live to righteousness for by his wounds you were healed this is not talking about physical healing this is talking about spiritual healing then what he did was that he took his son he took his son and raised him from the dead never again never to die again he did what the man, he did what man had always failed to do. In his son's resurrection, God began to build a lasting kingdom of righteousness, a new nation that is presently being made up of men from all earthly nations who desire and are willing to follow Jesus Christ supremely. He is calling out and forming a new people who genuinely been born again spiritually. 
These newborn people shall live eternally, but just one earthly generation. These people are identified as what? As his church today. That's what you and I belong to, to his church. Right? As a body of people who genuinely believe and follow him. They are destined to be the inhabitants of the new heavens and the new earth. Now, God, God acting solely upon his own through the death and the resurrection the resur through the death and the resurrection of his son, Jesus has fulfilled his promises to both Abraham and David. So when people ask me the question, you know, well, why did Jesus have to die? Because he had to fulfill a promise to Abraham and to David that from them a seed, a seed, singular, Christ, not seeds as in the nation of Jews, of Israel. No, no, no. A seed, Christ. And all of the people, all of the people of the nations of the world now have the what? They now have the opportunity the opportunity to become children of God, the special people of God. Let me draw your attention to, as a second note here, let me draw your attention to the book of John. John chapter 8, verse 54 and through 58. John chapter 8, the gospel of John, chapter 8, verse 54 to 58. Let's read this text starting in verse 54. Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. And you have not come to know him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I will be a liar like you, but I do know him. And he, and he says, and keep his word. Verse 56. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it, and he was glad. So the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and you have seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. What a clear, what a clear declaration of deity. So in this particular section, that we look in John chapter 8, verse 58, or 54 to 59, okay? We're talking about the oneness with God. Christ, his deity, the oneness with God. There is this great authority of Jesus to make such a glorious promise. And he goes out of his way to make it. Look, I think, I think we kind of forget that he made four, Jesus made four unique claims. Jesus made four unique claims. Number one, this is the reason why Matthew 1.1 1, 1 is so crucial. This is the record of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of Abraham, the son of David. The first thing, number one, is that Jesus claimed. What did he claim? He claimed that he was honored by God. Now, to the Jewish nation, that was horrifying. He was not, he was not out of honor himself. If he sought his own honor, his honor would be... Would, would amount to basically nothing. When, see, when a man is seen honoring and praising himself, it is considered to be a false salt, false honor. How many of us are running around with that problem? I mean, we got egos this size. It's just, it's just, just mamongous egos now. Look, self-honor, when you think about it, self-honor is discounted. It, look, when you're so egotistical about glorifying yourself and honoring yourself, okay, let me tell you something. Self-honor is discounted and considered absolutely distasteful and usually turns people away. It certainly does not attract people. That is if we're honest. However, there is one who does honor Christ. His Father honors him. You know, when we look at the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and if we look at it in in um, in that order specifically, that we say, no, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And what you notice throughout scriptures consistently from the Old Testament to the New Testament, here's what you notice consistently in the scriptures. You notice that the Holy Spirit always honored God the Son and God the Son always honored God the Father. 
Let me show you. Turn your Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 3, verse 17. Matthew chapter 3, verse 17. And look at this with me. And behold, a, this is at the baptism of Jesus. And behold, a voice out of the heaven said, he says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. God honored the son. Turn your Bibles to John chapter 5, verse 32. In John chapter 5, verse 32, it says, There is another who testifies of me, and I know that the testimony which he gives about me is true. Look at that same chapter, verse 37, 38. John chapter 5, verse 37, 38. And the Father who sent me, he has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. You do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe in him who sent, who he sent. Now, look at the look at look at the position that Scripture places Jesus, that the Christ, the Messiah, is being constant, constantly and consistently being honored. We'll turn your Bibles to John chapter eight. We're, we're in the Gospel of John, in John chapter eight, and look at verse eighteen. Verse eighteen says, "I am he who testifies about myself." And the Father who sent me testifies about me. Well, turn your Bible to the first epistle of John. The first epistle of John. 1 John chapter 5, verses 9 through 12. 1 John chapter 5, verses 9 through 12. And, it says, and he says this, If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God, the testimony of God is greater. For the testimony of God is this, that he has testified concerning his son, that the one who believes in the son of God has the testimony in himself. The one who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has given him concerning his son. And the testimony is this, that God had given us eternal life and this life is in his son. Verse 12. He who has the Son that has the life, and he who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. Now, I want you to note something. I want you to note, how would I say, um, a phenomenal claim. Who is Jesus' Father? Who is Jesus' Father? He, he is your God. Let me show you. Chapter 8, the book of John. John chapter 8. Look at verse 54. It says, and Jesus is speaking, and Jesus is responding. And it says, and Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, and of whom, and of whom you say, he is our God. See, he is the God who men so often profess. They profess all day long that God is my God. But he is the God who men do not really know. They have no clue when they say, well, God, yeah, I believe in God. What God are we talking about? See, men may say to know him, professing things like, um, they say things like this, God to be the creator and the sustainer of all. You, you hear that phrase? They'll say, um, to worship him is to follow him. They'll say, um, to be looked after and cared for by him, that that's what's happening in my life, even though they don't know him. But such claims are only imaginations. That's it. They're just imaginations. That's all they are, is imaginations, only ideas in man's mind. That's all it is. Jesus said that the man does not really know God, not, only, not, not the only true and living God, not really and not personally. Uh, uh, turn your Bibles to the book of Matthew. And in Matthew chapter 7, we see this in verse 21. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Turn your Bibles to the book of Mark. Mark chapter 7. Look at what he says in verse 6. Mark chapter 7 verse 6. 
And he said to them, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites. As it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. How many people that we know who profess to be Christians, this is how they live. Turn your Bibles to the book of Luke. And in Luke chapter 6, look what it says in verse 46. Luke chapter 6, verse 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? That is an incredible statement. How many people do you and I know? Hmm? How many people do you and I know that are exactly that way? The book of Titus. The book of Titus chapter 1 verse 16. In the book of Titus chapter 1 verse 16, it says this, They profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny him being, dis be being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. I'm going to turn your Bibles to 1 John chapter 3, verse 18. 1 John chapter 3, verse 18. Look what it says. He says, Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and in truth. Second, Jesus claimed, Jesus claimed that he personally, that he personally knew God and obeyed God's word. Now, that was a horrifying statement to the Jews back then. He had a unique and a very special knowledge of God. Jesus knew God as no one had ever seen or known him before. Well, let's go back to the book of Matthew. And notice what we're doing here. And what we're doing here is that we're just pouring a lot of scripture into your understanding as to why we get to Matthew chapter 1. And listen, we're just barely cracking the book open in Matthew chapter 1. And there's 28 chapters. In Matthew chapter 11, it says this in verse 27. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. This is Jesus. And no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. So we don't come to the Father until we come through the Son. John chapter 7. Turn your Bibles to John chapter 7 and look at verse 29. I know him because I am from him and he sent me. What a clear statement of deity this is. John chapter 8, verse 23. John chapter 8, verse 23, it says this. And he was saying to them, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. Jesus was very clear what he was talking about. Well, in that same chapter, chapter 8, look what he says in verse 42. John chapter 8, verse 42. He says, Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and have come from God. For I have not even come on my own initiative, but he who sent me. Stay with me. John chapter 8. Drop down to verse 55. John chapter 8, verse 55. Look at this. And you have not come to know him, but I know him. And if I say do, I do not know him, I will be a liar like you, but I do not know him and keep his word. But I do know him, and I keep his word. We'll look at John chapter 10, verse 15. John chapter 10, verse 15. Even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Well, look at John chapter 17, verse 25. John chapter 17, verse 25. O righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you, and these have not have known that you sent me. That's the reason why Matthew chapter 1, verse 1 is such a crucial verse to begin the book of Matthew. Listen, he says, the record of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of Abraham, the son of David. This is what we're talking about. And our people miss the richness, the depth of Scripture, because we don't take them to it. Note that Jesus refused to lie. Most men lie when they claim to know God, but he will not lie, okay? But he will not lie like they did. Let me give you an example. And let's, let's, let's just end this session, and we'll pick up in the next session. 
But in John chapter 8, verse 55 says this, And you have not come to know him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I will be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. We're going to pick this up in our next session. Until then.